Hi, everyone. I'm Kyler from The Content Mix, and I'm excited to be here with Estefania Veda, Marketing Campaign Manager at Clyde & Co. Clyde & Co. is a leading global law firm, which specializes in sectors that underpin global trade and commercial activity, such as the insurance, transport, infrastructure, energy, and trade and commodity sectors. And Estefania plays an integral role in the firm's campaigns and thought leadership. A data-driven marketer who specialized in strategy and planning across B2B and B2C environments, Estefania has excelled in her 10-year career in marketing. However, she started off as an independent filmmaker back in her home country of Argentina. Like many interested in marketing and content creation, like myself, she started off as a screenwriter um, and in film production, and I'm excited to learn more about her journey on today's episode. So I'd like to welcome Estefania to the Content Mix. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So I introduced you in my own words, but I'd love to hear more from you about who you are and where you're from and what's your connection to content marketing. Of course. So as you said, I was born and raised in Argentina, in Buenos Aires. I lived there until 2013. And uh, when I moved to England, I worked in casting for a few years. Mm -hmm. I worked for a wide range of productions, television, film, commercials, uh, all across Europe and further. And while I was in that role, I started working because I opened my own company. I started working on the company's brand and the company's communications and so on. And that's how I got interested in branding and marketing. And eventually I just made the switch. That's awesome. And was something like was moving to Europe or to the UK always something you had in mind or was it a, a decision to try something new? Um, I moved for... A, various reasons it's it's not something that i always had in mind but um it's something that eventually became a, an objective i just like working mm -hmm. london has is a very multicultural city and i've always loved that about here so yeah i've been here now for nearly 10 years or nine years so mm -hmm. yeah i think i yeah. like it and I always ask that because whenever we have someone from far away, right, coming from Europe, like, I mean, I'm from the U.S. and I moved to Europe and we've had many people from Argentina and Brazil. And I always wonder why, you know, it's a big journey to make. So it's really cool to hear that you love London and the diversity that it offers. And it's definitely a fantastic city to live in. And yeah. but so is Buenos Aires. And I want to talk a bit more about your time there. So as I mentioned, you started off your career as a shelf shooting director and producer in Buenos Aires, which is really, really cool because I love film and it's always, I'm sure many people listening do as well. <laughs> so we want to know a bit more about how, like what got you passionate about film production and filmmaking. And do you think the skills that you used during that time and the experience, um, do you use them today as a marketer? Yes. So the short answer to the first question would be Casablanca. Uh, my father was a big film buff and he would make me watch black and white films with subtitles way before I could even read. Mm -hmm. So that's how I started loving uh, and understanding the film language. And I was fascinated particularly about three aspects of film. Uh, first, the process. So how a film is created uh, as opposed to a novel, for example. Um, mm -hmm. To create a film, you need a big team with various skill sets and also the, the outcome, the fact that uh, the vision of a director is translated through that collaboration and you as, a, as a, the audience, you that and also the audience experience, particularly my experience to be able to, to lose myself in a film um, or a Netflix series. And also to, to see how feelings are developed, such as empathy, anger, as a result. And I absolutely think that you can use these skills and that I use these skills in my day-to-day -day life as a marketer, especially in my current role um, as a campaigns manager. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of content out there, as I'm sure we all are aware of. And I, I always ask, why would, why would your target audience read your content instead of you know, your competitors or someone else's? How do you differentiate your delivery? And there's no point really in creating brilliant content if no one is gonna access it or no one's going to consume it. So in this context, storytelling, for example, becomes uh, really relevant. Mm -hmm. And we are also going through a remarkable digital transformation at the moment. So when it comes to content marketing, we, we all know that the pandemic has accelerated the shift to digital channels and the use of visual content, uh, the use mm -hmm. of 
um, narrative techniques, for example, a podcast uh, requires that, um, needs to be creating, creative, innovative, and that is a key element, I believe, to differentiate your your messaging from your competitors. For sure. And I feel like, you know, filmmakers are people that are experts, right? And understanding the human emotion and the human experience and then transmitting that on stage and having the audience connect with it. I think the best films are the ones that we can connect with personally. And that's what marketing is, no? Like it's, you have to create content in this case that really connects with people and you have to understand what your target audience is, how they're feeling, what they're looking for, how they're going to engage and connect with your brand. So it's definitely a lot of parallels that I think a lot of people don't, you know, see straight off the bat. So it's really interesting to know that. And so then when you got involved in that world, right, of film production, um, in 2014, you co-founded Connor Management, where you led a small team of agents and managed a diverse array of talent for film, TV, print, commercials, and other media, um, securing up to 50 auditions and jobs per week, including select high-profile projects such as Outlander and Game of Thrones and James Bond, which is really interesting. So I want to learn more about that. So how did this opportunity come about in London? Because this is kind of what shifted, you know, made you move, I'm assuming, to the UK. And did this spark your interest in marketing in general? Because you were kind of representing people and trying to get them, their name out there. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I had done, when I moved to, to London, I was looking for jobs in the industry. And the first thing I got was an internship in an, in an agency, an acting agency. And then I knew actors already. So I started representing an actress by myself and then I represented another one. And then suddenly I had a hundred clients. So I wow. made it official. Yeah, I opened my own company and it taught me a lot about business and about uh, running a company and about mm -hmm. branding. And that's when I started becoming more interested in that side of mm -hmm. things and for example when an actor or an actress would book a really important job say for example outlander or game of thrones uh, it didn't it couldn't end there it had to we had to promote it we had to to share that experience because at the end of the day we we were competing with very well established companies and mm -hmm. we were a very small one so we had to find ways to differentiate ourselves and branding was one way that we Yes. You did that. Now, I'm also curious too, because I'm sure a lot of people that listen to the show and I have friends who are who are entrepreneurs in the way of or have, want to start their own business. And so a lot of people on the show that are listening to the show are from a diverse range of backgrounds. And a lot of them do are like, maybe I want to start a marketing agency, stuff like that. So I'm just curious, how is it to start a business in a different country? Um, and kind of, again, too, like, with that in mind, you've kind of shifted back. So now you're working for a company um, and you're not running your own. So kind of how was that experience? And do you miss being able to run your own company or? Um, I, I don't today. Maybe <laughs> in the future I will. Um, because running your own company, you like, I didn't take a vacation in like three yeah. years. The whole time I was there, it's, it's a big commitment and sure. it's very uncertain at times i loved it i loved the experience it i learned so much from it mm -hmm. and i don't discard the idea of eventually uh, doing it again but i'm very happy right now working <laughs> for for another firm and what was your other question just um how is opening a business in a different country oh just, how is that experience <laughs> well it's quite um overwhelming but to be honest, England or the UK makes it quite easy. It's it's not very okay. it's the, the um, it's not very bureaucratic. Uh, I'm from Argentina, and, and it would take much longer. It would be much more difficult, I believe. Mm -hmm. There in in the UK is is I didn't find it that hard logistically, but then creating it, making it successful, um, or at least being able to to have it make, make a living off it is yeah. th that's the hard part i would say for so sure. for me it's all about planning if you have a strong plan and then you just implement all the steps it you get right. there and it's like with any marketing campaign right if you have exactly, a plan yeah. then you implement it now so i'm obviously the storytelling aspect of film is what ins inspires you originally with your initial work, but also now in marketing, the storytelling aspect of marketing. So I, I kind of want to know why you decided to leave the film production management area um, and transition into marketing. My last job before um, uh, in the film industry was at a company called Creative Media Skills, which was based at Pinewood Studios. And 
I was, um, I was, I had just been promoted to general manager, and the first thing I did when I was appointed was a full marketing audit, and I ended up with a bunch of graphs that gave me so much information that I could then use to make decisions, and I really enjoyed that process, making, be, realizing that I had data that I could rely on to mm-hmm. make informed decisions made my life so much easier and also made me understand that certain for example uh, we would release certain campaigns as well in that in that company and it made me rea- it made me first identify that some of this content was much was receiving a better engagement from audiences than others so it made me question why and start thinking about that I could I thoroughly enjoyed that experience and I realized that I could uh, be creative with the acquired skills that I had gained from the film industry and apply it in other industries. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I decided to to make it official and I did a CIM qualification from the Chartered Institute of Marketing. And could you tell us a bit more about that qualification? I know it's something you're passionate about. Yes, I'm a big advocate for (laughs) the CIM because... um, when I when I decided to to actually change careers, I, I didn't know exactly how. And the CIM, actually, funnily enough, I, I met someone in the industry, and I thought I want to do what she's doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I stopped her a little bit. I, I looked at her <laughs> LinkedIn profile, and I realized that she she hadn't had she hadn't gone to uni- I, I didn't go to university to study marketing. I studied filmmaking, and I realized that she hadn't studied. I, anything related to marketing at university but she had done a few CIM courses and then a CIM qualification so I just followed all her steps she did (laughs) all the homework for me and I found the CIM the CIM is a platform you can become a member I'm a member and it's a platform that allows you to do training courses it has a lot of resources uh, book recommendations, mentoring programs. It's really for anyone who wants to get into marketing at any point of their lives, but even when you're looking to change career, I did it in my late 20s. So even when you're looking to change careers later in life, it's a fantastic route. It's a very clear route. And in a lot of job, um, in the job market, a CIM qualification many times is something that is asked. I do not work for the CIM. I'm just a true advocate. <laughs> Man. No, it's good to hear that. And I think it's also just really, you know, inspiring to hear how you decided to change your career because you're passionate. You found a new passion or new interest. I think a lot yeah. of times we're scared to make, you know, take the plunge and try something new. And you're kind of in a good example of, you know, you can do that and have success and also incorporate other aspects of your past career into your present one, which I think is really inspiring um, for me and for our listeners as well. Now, I mentioned in the beginning that you work at Clyde & Co. Um, and you there you lead inspiring marketing campaigns for the firm. So can you just tell us a bit more about what the firm is? And I know they're a huge firm and a big presence, in, especially in the UK. So I wanted to know a bit more about what they do. So, uh, Glenco, uh, we are a leading global law firm in our core sectors that include insurance and construction and other sectors. And my role there, I was brought in to manage a campaign called Resilience. And this campaign was focusing on uh, global risks that affect all sectors. And it looks at the global risk that business leaders are facing at the moment. So mm-hmm. initially, it mainly focused on climate change, but now um, with the pandemic and also with a big shift to digital, it also covers digital transformation and post-pandemic risk. I now manage more campaigns, not just resilience, but um, that's why I was brought in. And yeah. That's awesome. And so that's really cool that you started off with this global thought leadership campaign, which you mentioned called Resilience. And now you're working on, I'm assuming, multiple campaigns. I kind of wanted to know more a bit about like, what's your typical day like for you at work? Um, And what are your main areas of responsibility? So clearly, yeah, doing these campaigns, but also I'm sure if you manage other teams or you're working with other teams. Like yes, absolutely. So the leadership team would communicate. We, we, of course, are aware of the key priorities of the business and the leadership team will communicate content that needs to be produced at a given time. And we, well, this 
to use resilience as an example, uh, we we released a report back in April, a climate change risk and liability report. And to create any of these reports, you need to work with uh, many people with across departments. And that the, that's the first thing I do, create the core team for the campaign. So uh, we have a copywriter with whom I work uh, mostly to interview our partners to, to get whatever it is that we want to include in the report. We also have, uh, I, I work with the comms team for anything that, that is PR. I work with the wider marketing team for, you know, email marketing, social campaigns, and so on. Mm -hmm. And so once the core team is confirmed, um, as I do with everything, really, I create a project plan that is quite comprehensive and goes from the, the very early stages until uh, performance analy analy analysis, sorry, goes from the very early stages until performance analysis. And... Yeah, and, and then I chase people up, and that's pretty much what I do all day. <laughs> so I, once I set, I set the plan, I, I, I work with people to implement it, and then I just monitor it and, and chase people up. And of course, there's a lot of things that I, I do as well um, to implement it, but at this stage, I mostly work with other people and, and support yeah. them with whatever they need. That's awesome. So I'm sure you're motivating them. And it's a probably a really cool experience to see how your ideas are really, you know, manifest and how your team takes, you know, makes that happen for you and how you, you get to play this like creative role, you know, leading them throughout the process. That's really interesting. Um, and now to kind of dive in a bit more about, you know, the marketing side of things, I kind of want to know if you have an example of a campaign or a piece of content that's really worked well for you. And it could be from your, your whole career. It doesn't have to be just from your time at Clyde & Co. Of course, yes. Well, I'll give you an example of Clay & Co. Um, each December, we release uh, insurance predictions. It used to be mostly a PR campaign, and as such, it did perform very well. But last year, in the midst of the pandemic, mm -hmm. we decided to maximize the, the use of the digital channels for to promote it. So we put together a social plan, and every day, every working day, from the 1st of December until just before Christmas, we would release one, two, three uh, predictions. We divided them to fit with our strategy into climate change, digital transformation, post-pandemic risk, and uh, insurance specific, because these are insurance predictions. Mm -hmm. And later in January, we released a compilation of all these predictions as a report, which allowed us to connect with clients directly as well, and also, it allowed us to generate leads to put the report behind, behind a, a download form on the website and so on. And it was a brand new website at the time. So that can be work really well because we did use, the only thing we didn't use, uh, I don't believe were podcasts, but we did use video animations to promote it. So, and it was bite-sized content. It was uh, short content, which made, even though eventually it was released as a report, we got a lot of engagement when we were releasing these shorter pieces of content. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And I just want to know, like, what social channels do you guys use at Cloud and Like, your target audience, where do they engage the most? Well, I think uh, LinkedIn is our most mm -hmm. relevant um, social channel. And yes, in previous companies, for example, when I used to work at Creative Media Skills, we used Instagram a lot mm -hmm. because I believe now they're using TikTok maybe or other, other platforms. But Instagram was really because where at Creative Media Skills, we would develop courses and events for the for very established professionals in the film industry. For example, mm. we would have someone like Kazuhiro Tsuji, who who at, like a couple of years ago won an Oscar, uh, and he would come and teach about his techniques. And for that, because it was very visual, he's a makeup artist, so Instagram was really good we we yeah. had a, a lot of engagement there we, linkedin was not the exactly. best platform in that case i was wondering if people like yeah if people are in, in, interested right in insurance wherever they go linkedin makes total sense in that yeah. case and it's always a, you have to really you know tailor your content to it according to the platform because every platform is so different and how it works in engagement and all these things as well although now we're also using podcasts quite a bit so really? spotify is becoming a, a popular channel as well yeah, that's really cool. And have you done a lot of podcasts in your experience? Or, well, I think we have 
we, we recently launched a, a podcast called A Climate for Change that looks at the risks that stem from uh, climate risk in the different sectors that we prioritize. And we have probably around maybe seven or eight more and many mm -hmm. more in the planning. So, yeah. That's fantastic. And it's really cool that you guys are talking about, you know, really relevant topics like climate change and something that's, you know, really important, not just for people, you know, in the insurance sector and the, the sectors that you're working with, but also in general. I think it's going to be an interesting podcast for anyone to listen. And then they also get to learn more about your brand at the same time, which is great. Now, I kind of ask this question to everybody <laughs> because it's always interesting to hear what people say. But in your opinion, what do you think some companies get wrong when it comes to content marketing? Because you are a content marketer and I'm sure you see many things because you're spending time on different, you know, social media platforms and you kind of maybe see different things. That you're like, mm, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> so I kind of <laughs> want to know, like, in your opinion, what do you think some companies get wrong? Generally, I sometimes find that the overall strategy behind a particular firm's content marketing is not fully understood by the teams that actually work uh, in content marketing. And this results sometimes in lack of consistency and, and a confusing message. Specifically for V2B, I would like to highlight three issues. The tone of voice, uh, even though V2B firms target other businesses, is what we were saying earlier about storytelling. Uh, you're still talking to people, you're still trying to engage actual people. So the content sometimes when you're trying to think of the business instead of the person uh, can be a bit dry, I find. Then the volume of content. I think it's always better to publish less content, but work harder mm -hmm. to make this content reach the right audiences. For example, with account-based marketing than to just publish. And sometimes I see that companies even on LinkedIn, they publish a lot of content and they have really at least no, no, no engagement that I can see. And then the length of the content. I do think that there's still um, long, long form content is still relevant, mm -hmm. but you can always say everything in fewer words and fewer pages. So there is a lot of content out there and bite size content, whether it's to promote a larger campaign or to just have as main content, it would be, should be used more. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think it's really interesting too, what you said about, you know, kind of less is more and making sure you really curate and work on the content because it's so important. I feel, you know, in my experience, I've also worked with clients that maybe didn't understand that and the importance of, you know, the quality of the content is, you know, something that I really stand by, but also I think it's so important. If you have really good content, you don't have to post as many times. You probably would get more engagement on something that's more, you know, interesting and well-developed for your audience as well. So I definitely agree with you on that. Um, now, as I mentioned before too, you know, our listeners are, you know, a large range <laughs> of backgrounds, whether they're new to marketing and they're very experienced or people that want to start, you know, like entrepreneurial backgrounds, stuff like that. Now, I always ask this question too, is I kind of want to know from your opinion, um, what skills do you think are most important for marketers nowadays? And what advice would you give to someone that's just starting out now? And you have, you know, you recently started, not recently, but in your career, you kind of made that shift. So you know what it's like to start off in marketing. So I feel like this, you'd be able to answer this question very well. There are many, but if I could prioritize a few skills or groups of skills, I'd highlight the following ones. A commercial skills, uh, such as uh, commercial acumen or uh, customer knowledge, these are skills that of course come with experience, but I think they're essential to understand um, not what you have to do in your role, but why, why, why you're doing this, how is this going to benefit the firm you're working for. Um, second, project management skills. I think to manage any project, anything, to manage your day, you need project management skills. So I think that's a key, key skill for marketers, especially because we work with so many departments. Um, it's not, our, our teams are always different. So we need to, to have good project management skills, which leads to people management skills, because we work with so many people. And I strongly believe that even if you're an intern, you need to know how to, you need to develop those skills because they're always helpful. Uh, also to manage people that are managing you. Sometimes it's good mm -hmm. to, to know how to, to request what you need to be managed properly. And that requires um, people management yes. skill. Mm -hmm. Storytelling and copywriter to ensure that your message gets across to your entire audience properly. An understanding of digital channels uh, and an understanding to stay up to date with current trends. Mm -hmm. That's very important. 
analytics, I'm a very data-driven person. I think all, all, everything you need to know is, <laughs> in the data. is there. You just need to find out. And finally, I'd say, and in no way less important than the ones already mentioned, but it's a good can-do attitude. A few examples include, for example, staying professional at all times, looking for solutions instead of complaining about whatever doesn't work, having conversations with your colleagues about non-work related subjects, even if what you prefer to be doing is watching a Netflix film, just make that time. I think that the way that you approach your work will make you or break you. Most other skills can, can be learned. That's true. That's really interesting. And I think something that we have to keep in mind too is the human aspect of the work experience. It's not just work, work, work all the time, but it's about how you collaborate and how you ask for help and how you ask for different things and, and learning and being able to be humble, I think at the same time is so important. Knowing that you can learn from your colleagues, whether they're an intern or you know your manager or the head of the company, everyone has something to share. Um, now I, I want to know a bit more too. Now we're talking about like, you know, what we need in the workplace and kind of, you know, these skills that we need to have, but I want to know a bit more about you and if you have any like ha habits that you attribute to your success, like daily habits that you would do. So a lot of people would, say, you know, say like, oh, yoga or in the morning, I don't know. Everyone has like a little like routine or something that they do every day that helps them stay focused in the workplace. So I wanted to know if you have any. Yeah, for me, it's organization. It's great. It's having a plan. Uh, and also having a list, but not a list of tasks, but a list of objectives of the day. So mm -hmm. the tasks, you know, sometimes tasks can be, it's nice to take them off your list, but I think it's better to work with objectives than with tasks. Mm -hmm. um, then pick up the phone. Uh, that's something I do. Whenever you're working on something and you have a question, sometimes it's easier to just pick up the phone and have a five minutes brainstorm with someone. And that will save you hours of um very long email change. And then uh, something I say question the question because in, in my case, we work with so many departments and we're busy and sometimes something someone asks a question and it seems like an innocent question. But then if you actually think of that, answering that question could have really a lot of implications and it can get out of hand. So just stop for a second, take a breath and think what it is someone is asking you and if, if, if your question should be simply, if your, sorry, reaction should be simply answering that question, or if you should be asking something about it, why do you want mm -hmm. to know this? Um, and then the another one is accepting and embracing feedback. Uh, you should find it interesting that people sometimes are very defensive when it comes to feedback, mm -hmm. but companies are always trying to get feedback from, from their customers, right? And at the end of the day, if we get feedback, it's, it's a really good, chance for us to to learn about our performance and improve it yeah i think feedback is such an important part of this the work experience and you know learning and in the humility i was talking about before and being able to accept okay i didn't do it right but i'm also maybe learning from my colleagues about how to do it better the next time and that will help you go longer in the future with your career um, and further and i wanted to know I think you're talking about, you know, picking up the phone, which I think is so important. I think especially in like this remote world that we live in that sometimes it's just like we can go back and forth with emails forever and ever. And I always say it's so important to pick up the phone and have that human interaction. I just want to know, are you working fully from home now or are you back in the office? I'm doing two days a week in the office and three days at home, which is nice. fantastic. Fantastic. Um, it's, it's, I'm so happy about this hybrid working because it allows me to, because again, with campaigns, for example, uh, I have I work, I work with it. It helps me have meetings about these campaigns and then have a day or two to action, whatever it is that I have assigned myself to do, mm -hmm. and then have another touch point in which we can uh, monitor the progress. So it just really helped organize myself and organize awesome. my workload. Yeah, it gives you a nice balance as well. And, I yeah, and also like, you can do laundry, you know. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you can wake up, just put the laundry in. You can do um, a lot of things. You, you can get Make a delivery. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. get deliveries. It's super nice. Yeah. It's a good balance for sure. It's a good balance. Yeah. Now, do you have a professional role model or a source of inspiration that drives you every day? Um, that's it. Um, I have someone, um, someone I used to work with. Mm -hmm. And she was, she, she actually worked uh, with climate change and she developed a lot of climate change products and she was so passionate about what she did and she was so kind and mm. so 
credible you know you have a conversation with her and you immediately knew that she knew what she was talking about and also so humble because if she didn't know she would simply tell you and so confident so i would say um it's i'm not gonna name her but this person who had, uh, i used to work with and she had all the soft skills that i uh, aspire to have and really yeah. excellent technical knowledge as well Awesome. And it's cool to see like someone that is, you know, an expert can even say, hey, I don't really know, but I'll let you know, you know, I'll look exactly. into that. And it's so important. It's something that I think a lot of people forget about or try not to do, but something that we should be doing is saying, OK, yeah. well, I don't know 100 percent, but I'll get back to you. And, and then that way you learn at the same time. Absolutely. Really and great. so many times I, I I would hear her say, oh, you know what, that's my bad 100 percent. I just and, and to have that confidence instead of acting defensively or trying to you know blame it on someone else yeah i think that's that's really really good yeah um now you also we talked about the certification that you did before and but i wanted to know if you have any other like recommendations when it comes to like apps or tools platforms or books or things that you use on your daily you know on a daily basis that help you I do a lot of uh, regular training, learning and development uh, with the CIM uh, sometimes, mm -hmm. but also actually uh, Client Go is fantastic at that, at offering uh, learning and development courses. Uh, so I do that. And also I try to stay up to date. I subscribe to the Marketing Week, which mm -hmm. is um, uh, it's a, a marketing magazine. With the CIM, by being a member, I also receive a magazine at home called Catalyst, which is published on a quarterly basis and mm -hmm. it has a lot of information about what's happening in in the marketing world and um, a lot of the things we have talked about here are covered in that magazine mm -hmm. latest skills that are required for marketers etc that's really good and i also really enjoy reading books for example i was about i, I haven't read it yet but it's in my in my list a book <laughs> called good strategy bad strategy I don't know if you've heard of that, no. but uh, yes. So I, I try to always read. Uh, yeah, and keep learning. Book. I think it's, yeah. so, it's so important um, in any field, but also it's particularly in marketing, especially now with things changing so quickly and you have to stay like on the pulse, you know, and make sure that you're not falling behind in the latest trend or, you know, learning, just learning more, continuous learning is so important. So it's really great that you continue to do that. And also like, it does seem like the community with the certifications, like you get so much from that. It does seem yeah. like, so it's really also, great. Another thing is, if you if there's any way you can get a mentor, I think that's always good, and the, the CIM offers that. But even if it's not a an official mentor, if you have someone at work, if your if your workplace does not have a program, a mentoring program, if you have someone at work that could, you know, act as your mentor, I think that's yeah. fantastic. I, I agree. I think it's really important to learn from the people that you work with or, you know, have someone that gives you that advice, you know, whether you're at the, you know, the pinnacle of your career or even you're starting out, it's always a great thing to have a mentor and someone to help you and show you the ropes. Um, yeah. We've come to the end of our interview and I really first want to thank you again for everything because it's been such an interesting conversation to learn about your past and kind of how you ended up in this world of marketing and how you found your passion, you know? Um, and it's something that, you know, I mean, we can sense the passion from here and um, it does seem like it'd be, you know, your team and everyone you work with, it's definitely a pleasure to work with you. Um, now, I just want to know if you have any final takeaways or parting advice for our audience from the interview today. Well, no, just as someone that has changed careers, um, if you or if anyone who is listening is considering it, it looks and it seems daunting. And sometimes it seems that you have to take a step back. But the thing is that if you do take a step back, when you take the following step, it's much quicker and it, you've made so much more progress than you mm -hmm. would think. So it's it, it's only scary for the first two months and then it becomes exactly. easy. So I would say if for anyone looking to, to do that, whether well, it's, to become a marketer or to become something else that is not a marketer, I think that's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not as it. difficult as it seems. It's worth it, yeah. Yeah, as humans, I think we're just scared of, sometimes we can be scared of change. We can't let that hold us back from chasing our dreams and trying something new. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, if, if you're in a, in a job that makes you happy, for example, I think you trade a couple, two, three months for, you know, a lot of many, for many good days afterwards. So yeah. I think it's worth it. I agree. Um, now, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Because I'm sure if anyone wanted to ask you questions or learn more from you, are, are you active anywhere else besides LinkedIn? Because we connected on LinkedIn. So, 
Yes, I think LinkedIn is the best way to talk about this. Absolutely, it's um, I I I have a very um, uh, I'm very controlled when it comes to social media. So uh-huh. I have one. I, I check LinkedIn once a week, and I check Instagram once a week. I just don't let myself do it much more than that wow, that's because awesome. I work. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, yeah, and I, I'm quite um, strict. So I will definitely, if anyone contacts me on LinkedIn, I will reply within a week. <laughs> Perfect. That's really good. Self-discipline on social media is an important skill to have nowadays. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm Absolutely. very jealous of you. But <laughs> again, Stephanie, I really want to thank you for sharing your insights with us today on the show. Um, and I also want to thank everyone for listening in. As always, for more perspectives on the content marketing industry in Europe, please check out veracontent.com slash mix. And keep tuning to the podcast for more interviews with content experts like Stephania. So we'll see you next time. And thanks again, Stephania. Thank you.